Chapter One Pomeroy's Close Confinement in the Massachusetts State Penal Institutions There can be no doubt that the most interesting convict in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, if not in the whole country, is Jesse Harding Pomeroy. He is the only convict in the United States who is absolutely consigned to a cage and who is looked upon by the community as a veritable fiend. For years he has been an inmate of the Massachusetts State Prison and has been a constant source of trouble and annoyance to the officers of the institution. His history is interesting, for he is a person with very marked characteristics. There are peculiar people, those with hobbies and who are often called cranks, who are met with every day. Some of them have a leaning toward one thing and some another. It has been said that such persons were born with these peculiarities and that they have no control over their actions when directed in the line of their characteristics. It is a question with not a few intelligent men and women whether a person should be punished for doing a thing which he or she could not help it must be admitted that when the inclinations of an individual are such that the community is endangered it is a public duty for the proper officers to take charge of such a person whatever then may be the opinion of any one in regard to the punishment inflicted on the subject of this book certain it is that the public is better satisfied and feels a greater security with Pomeroy safe behind the bars of the prison. There are those who do not believe in solitary confinement of convicts. This statement is corroborated by a letter published by a prominent New York daily newspaper, of which the following is an abstract. Solitary confinement of refractory criminals in prisons or reformatories or of the inmates of lunatic asylums is unquestionably just and wise but solitary confinement for a long term of years of a human being in a normal state of mind would seem to be more in the nature of a torture worthy only of the middle ages solitary confinement or what is in reality isolation in pomeroy's case to the average mind is most terrible and yet what could be done with pomeroy if he was allowed the privileges of the prison the same as other convicts neither the prison officials or the public would tolerate his being given an opportunity to be at large even behind the high walls of the institution it might be possible that he would make a successful escape such is the feeling in regard to this one man that mothers especially would be in a constant state of alarm from fear that he would escape and do irreparable injury to children or that he would at the first opportunity commit another murder it is therefore desirable that this convict should continue in a condition of isolation inside the granite walls of the massachusetts state prison it is far better that one individual should suffer than that the community should be placed in fear. Even the fact that he is in close confinement is not wholly satisfactory to many reputable citizens. They are not backward in expressing their belief that the Commonwealth would have been far better off had he been executed soon after the time of his conviction rather than that the death sentence should have been commuted to close confinement for life in the state prison there is a limit to human endurance it is not well to bestow too much charity on such a man as pomeroy time as is well known tends to soften the asperities of the human heart and often leads one to condone grievous faults it is well under all circumstances to examine into the causes which lead to the condition of affairs weigh the evidence on both sides and award a verdict in accordance with the facts the one-sided view taken by not a few in regard to criminals 
does not benefit the community which must be protected from the evil disposed law must be respected the general condemnation of pomeroy has doubtless prevented the circulation of a petition for his pardon or to allow him some of the privileges enjoyed by the other convicts his crimes were outrageous had it not been for his youth he would have paid the penalty for his offences on the scaffold he took a fiendish delight in tormenting and torturing boys who were younger than himself when asked why he did so he would reply that he could not help it some unknown power seized him and he was changed almost instantly from a boy in his teens to a devil he loved to witness the effects of his cruel acts and would dance in glee around the victim he had selected for his horrible pleasure these facts would have seemed impossible of belief had it not been for the testimony which was introduced at the trial and the admittance of its truth by the counsel for the defense the point which counsel sought to make was that while pomeroy was guilty of atrocious murder he was not responsible for his acts that he was insane and that the jury should find him not guilty by reason of insanity if the jury had returned such a verdict it would have been obligatory upon the supreme judicial court to have sentenced the prisoner to one of the state asylums for the insane during his natural life very important evidence was presented on both sides the most expert doctors on insanity being placed on the witness stand by the defense as well as by the government the jury notwithstanding the able efforts of counsel for the defense returned a verdict of murder in the first degree the evidence of the insanity experts was so contradictory that the jury could not well consider that the prisoner was insane although he was wanting in will-power in a few words pomeroy when opportunity offered would commit assaults knowing at the time that he was doing wrong and yet was not possessed of sufficient moral strength to resist the temptation this has been the case with many criminals but they have not been led to commit murder or to inflict torture i bring to mind one man now serving out a sentence in the charlestown prison this being his second term in that institution this man would be law-abiding so long as he abstained from the use of liquor as soon however as he became intoxicated he would steal it made no difference to him what article he purloined he seemed to be impelled to commit a theft when he had become sober and informed of what he had done he could give no reason why he had stolen there are convicts in the massachusetts state prison and i doubt not in similar institutions in other states who steal every time a chance is offered they steal from each other they love to steal they cannot resist the desire whether this desire was born in them or acquired i am unable to say it is not my intention in this history to enter into a lengthy discussion on the subject of pomeroy's sanity nor is it my desire to comment on existing laws as regards the conviction and imprisonment of men and women and children who commit offenses because they could not help it the legislatures of the various states are ever endeavoring to make the laws more humane whether these deliberative bodies have succeeded in this direction it is for the public to judge the community must not however be subjected to the evil acts of individuals and offenders against society must be punished whether or not they were impelled to commit the acts i do not want to be understood as being devoid of sympathy for the convict 
confined in a penal institution under a heavy sentence i have a very warm place in my heart for this class some of the convicts in the massachusetts bastille have occupied high places of trust but in an unguarded moment turned from the path of honesty and then in a shorter or longer period of time reached the state prison in dealing with convicts it must be kept in mind that they are human beings and should receive the sympathy and care of the state it is in this light that the case of pomeroy should be viewed he is a ward of the state and must be cared for as humanely as possible it is well however that he is confined more closely than any of the other prisoners in the institution the interests of the community are better subserved in this way he is not likely to harm anyone in his present apartments and his incarceration has not apparently done him much injury jesse must be looked upon as being situated in the best possible manner for the public and himself i cannot do better in order to give the reader valuable information than to quote from an interesting pamphlet entitled criminals written by dr charles d sawin formerly physician at the massachusetts state prison and who had pomeroy under his care for five years the learned physician said for the sake of refreshing the mind of the reader we will state that pomeroy was tried and convicted in eighteen seventy four for the murder of a little boy four years and three months old and during this trial it was proven that he had at various times been guilty of acts of the most atrocious cruelty towards other children as the district attorney stated in his opening address this child when found possessed a body still warm throat cut and some fifteen or twenty stabs in the region of the heart the little boy's hands were wounded more or less there were marks of wounds upon his arms suggesting perhaps the possibility of feeble struggles to resist the government charged deliberate murder with malice aforethought and carried out with a considerable degree of atrocity and cruelty a number of experts were called in and examined jesse on various occasions previous to the trial when actors disagree in their estimate of such a well-defined character as hamlet how is it to be wondered at that mental experts offer such divergent views concerning the responsibility for his acts of such a young boy as pomeroy when playing on the stage of life pomeroy entered the prison his sentence having been commuted to solitary imprisonment for life september ninth eighteen seventy six when he was seventeen years old during a portion of his term he has been permitted many privileges and diversions such as reading and painting at one time he evinced a strong desire to improve his mind and he studied french german and latin his knowledge of the languages is however only a smattering one of late he has taken a special liking to chemistry and a slight spark of inventive genius has been manifested in his endeavors to construct a hollow self-sharpening lead pencil in which he takes great pride his paintings are hardly worth admiring but he looks upon them as works of art this fact demonstrating to the observer that his standard is not very high without doubt his intellect and moral sense must have improved to a certain degree since he is not associated with other prisoners and he hasn't passed through any stage of devolution his first punishment in prison was four and a half days in a dark cell on november ninth eighteen seventy seven for trying to escape digging cement out of a cell on the average 
he has received six and one-half days punishment each year, in most cases for tampering with his cell structure in attempting to escape. He, on one occasion, was punished for insolence to an officer, once for refusing to obey an order, and once for writing an insolent letter to the warden. Not very serious offenses, these. He has never exhibited his former love to torture at any time during his incarceration in prison, which seems rather strange, were he insane at the time of the murders. He is remarkably cunning, clever, and quick to see the drift of any conversation, logical and clear in understanding, but notably self-willed and persistent. His bodily health has been remarkably good, eating and sleeping well, seldom complaining of his diet, and never asking for favors or extra rations. In a recent interview, he stated that he thought his memory was very good in regard to some occurrences, as, for instance, his life in jail and his first four years in prison, but he had no recollection of ever meeting Dr. Folsom, and only an indistinct remembrance of his trial. According to Dr. Sawin, Pomeroy has not suffered in bodily health during his many years of close confinement. Imprisonment for a long term of years has not, in numerous instances, proven hurtful physically. There was one convict in the Massachusetts State Prison who was pardoned after serving thirty-five years of a life sentence. When he left the institution, he said that he had never seen a horse car and knew but little about steam railroads. He was in good health, and his eyesight was not impaired to any great extent. He said he had never expected to leave the prison. But as he was to be a free man, he would pass some time in finding out what had been going on while he had been in imprisonment. The New York Sun recently contained the following remarkable statement. A few weeks ago, a brigand chief, Domenico Noccia, was released from the Naples prison after having been shut up for sixty years. He is now eighty-three. After an unusually brilliant career of brigandage, and thirty-five thousand francs had been set upon his head, he was condemned to prison for life in 1831. It is natural to suppose that men confined in a prison would pine away and die. Such is not the case. The individual, having been apprehended, tried, convicted, and sentenced to a term of imprisonment, changes the course of his existence when he enters the prison. If he has no ailment at that time, or has not a hereditary trouble, his chances for a long life are good. His mind, the great factor in the matter of his health, becomes tranquil. He finds that a prison is not the terrible place that he had once imagined it was. He realizes that he has become a debtor to the community by reason of his having violated the law, and he begins to pay off his indebtedness. These statements are corroborated by the fact that there has rarely been a suicide, or an attempt at suicide, in the Massachusetts State Prison. I can only recall, in twenty-five years, but one suicide and only one attempt at self-destruction. In the first instance, there was a cause for the suicide, if there ever was a good and sufficient reason for such an act. The convict had been a prominent financier. He lived in luxury, and the society of his family was courted by persons of wealth. His resources seemed unlimited and yet there came a day when he was arrested on a charge of fraud. His conviction soon followed, and in a short space of time he donned a convict's garb. He bore up grandly. 
he learned of the disasters to his family with comparative composure. He was told by his wife that all of their property had been seized for the satisfaction of injured parties, and that she had gone to work as a dressmaker in a not very fashionable part of the city of Boston. She found no fault with him, but cheered him by words of encouragement and continued affection. He was strengthened by her words. Her letters and visits to him made him happy, very happy, even in his prison dress and narrow cell. He knew that in time he would be a free man, and that he could try and retrieve his shattered fortune by a course of honorable dealing with his fellow man. As he looked forward, he could discern rifts in the dark clouds of his existence, and through them he caught glimpses of the bright sunlight of joy and prosperity. He was lifted above the surroundings of a life of penal servitude, with the pictures of his dear devoted wife and his children ever in his mind his pathway became less thorny and his burdens easier but there came a time of the greatest sorrow for this convict his wife unaccustomed to the hardships and deprivations of life became ill sad were the moments and very, very long were the hours during which he awaited the receipt of tidings from the bedside of her whom he loved, whom he adored. At last the final blow came. A female relative called at the prison to see him. He was summoned from his work into the octagon, and this relative abruptly informed him that his wife was dead. The prisoner bowed his head and wept. In his deep anguish, the visitor upbraided him for his criminal acts which had brought him to prison. She charged him with causing the death of his wife. With bitter words she told him of the disgrace he had brought upon his family. She left him angrily. He was not aware of her departure until the officer in charge of the octagon touched him gently upon the shoulder. He looked up. He was very pale, and tears continued to course down his cheeks. He returned to his place in the workshop. Although granted permission to pass the remainder of the day in his cell, he declined the offer. When evening came, he returned to his room. He did not take his supper from the kitchen slide. No one will ever know the bitterness of his thoughts at that time. He had in his cell a quantity of Paris green. How it came there I could never ascertain. Here was a means of ending a life which had become unbearable. Where could he look for consolation? Death now had no terrors for him. The narrow confines of a grave were far more desirable than the mental torture he was undergoing. All that he had to live for had suddenly become eliminated, for his children had also passed away. The darkness of despair enveloped him. He took the poison, and it did its work, although the convict died in the greatest agony. At the autopsy, the operating surgeon remarked, "'He and I were schoolfellows. I never thought I should stand over his remains under such sad circumstances. His life has shown what an inordinate desire for wealth may do for a man. I hope that his spirit has found rest.'" The instance of an unsuccessful attempt at suicide in the Massachusetts State Prison was that of a convict, about thirty years old, who leaped from the upper corridor of the west wing. His right shoulder struck against the iron steam piping near the floor, and he was only slightly injured. The prisoner gave no explanation for his act. Jesse Pomeroy has never made any attempt to injure himself. He is very considerate concerning his person. 
if he ever did entertain a desire to commit suicide which i think he never did he must have been kept from attempting self-destruction by the regard he has held for his relatives some of them have been very faithful to him their words have always been those of great encouragement i remember quite a number of years ago of reading a letter sent to jesse in it he was told to be good and true he was requested to study and acquire knowledge he was assured that he would not always be a prisoner confined as he was but that he would be released in time and would associate with people of the world at large he was told that some day he might occupy a high position in society the letter showed that there was someone who loved him notwithstanding the bitterness of the world toward him although his hands had been bathed in human blood there was an affection which had not been obliterated he has been visited by relatives whenever the regulations of the prison would admit there can be no doubt that some of his relations have the kindest and most sympathetic feelings for him the idea that he was insane when he committed his cruel atrocious and murderous acts is doubtless entertained by them end of chapter one